Hello, good morning. Welcome to our online service here at Christchurch Liverpool. I'm Alex and I'm really excited to be here. I really enjoyed last week hearing Ray speak to us about um, the benefits and the joys of being part of God's church and how even though that could be difficult while it's growing, there's plenty to celebrate as well. I hope you enjoyed today's service. Bye. Welcome to Christchurch Liverpool. Well, whether you're a member, a regular or new to Christchurch, I want to say a big welcome. And to any children that are watching, a huge big welcome to you too. And I do hope, kids, that you're enjoying actually getting to see your friends when you do get to go along to CFS. It's lovely to actually be able to see so many people in person these days. My name's Lindsay. I'm an associate minister at Christchurch, working with women and in missions, and I'm going to be leading us through this service today. Please join in, not only by watching, but please post a hello or comment in the live chat to the side or any prayer request that you might have. This is a really nice chance to welcome everybody and also to encourage others who are tuning in today. So, how are you all doing these days? The weather's been all over the place recently, hasn't it? <laughs> but I hope that you've been enjoying starting to be able to see friends and family that perhaps you've missed seeing for a really long time now, all of course in accordance with UK government guidelines. We've been learning a lot through this COVID time just about how valuable, please, people close to us are. And that people and relationships really, really matter. Being with people matters. And so, we had a really great time last Sunday at the end of our weekend around, when lots of us could gather together and catch up and spend some time together at the end of our services at CFS. It was great to see so many people again. It was great to welcome new people from the community. A really encouraging time and greatly added to by most excellent ice cream. <laughs> so please come along and join us in person if you can. Our in-person services are back to being the main way that we're meeting together. But please don't worry if you can't make it, we will still be here online because we know that many of you can't make it for very good reason and also we can't fit everybody in each week. But do try and sign up through our website for our services. There seem to be lots of spaces at the 9.30 for some reason. <laughs> Get up nice and early, come and join us and we'd love to see you. But we will be here online. Well, however we meet, whether we're in person or online, we meet together at Christchurch Liverpool to meet Jesus Christ primarily, to love his church and to connect with Liverpool. So on that, let's have a reading now from the Bible. We're going to read now from Psalm number 24 and verses 1 to 4. I'll read the first verse, we can all read the second, I'll read the third, and we can all read the last verse together. Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord, who may stand in his holy place, the one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false God. Let's pray together. We come before you, O Lord God, as the holy God, so different from us, 
pure, perfect, right, just. Our selfishness stands in stark contrast to your holiness. Your holiness shows up our weaknesses. Who of us can approach you? Lord, we thank you that in Christ we can stand before you in his holiness, that we are safe before you in him. Lord, may we choose to live the way that he has taught us and demonstrated. May we be those who have clean hands and a pure heart, those who do not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. O oh Lord, you alone are fit to be worshipped. We come before you and worship you today. Thank you for accepting all who trust in the holiness of Jesus. And we pray and thank you in his name. Amen. Let's now join together singing, He is our God. And why don't you open your windows and sing out loudly so those on your street can really hear some great songs with great words this morning.
Let's pray together. Lord, we worship you, our holy God. You alone are holy, matchless in your glory. Holy God, so different from us, yet you came to save us. Thank you for your immeasurable kindness and love. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's now time for you to get your Bible out for the reading today. The reading will be from the Old Testament book of Proverbs, and we're going to be reading in chapter 3. Josh Daly, who's one of our students, will be reading to us from Proverbs 3, 5 to 10, before Josh Probert, one of our associate ministers, comes and preaches to us. I think I've got the Joshes right. Yes. So Proverbs 3, 5 to 10. Good morning, all. Today's reading is taken from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 to 16, read from the NIV translation. That is Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 to 16. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him, and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honour the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, as a father the son he delights in. Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding, for she is more profitable than silver, and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies, nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand, in her left hand are the riches and honour. Well, thanks for that. Yes, my name is Josh Probert and I'm an Associate Minister here at Christchurch Liverpool. Uh, do keep that passage open in front of you. We are going to look um, at that passage from Proverbs for a little while now. Because over the last six months, we have had more changes in our behaviours and patterns of life than most of us will have had in the last decade. We've had a national lockdown and we've had freedoms, things we were free to do that we haven't been free to do. Things like going to each other's homes and going to our favourite shops and restaurants. But now, of course, things are changing. We are doing what Morris said two weeks ago, he put it like this, we are we're stepping out into the light, blinking. We've got lots of new options and possibilities in front of us as a lot of the freedoms and choices we haven't had, well, we've now got those back. And so we've decided at Christchurch to do this little mini series in the book of Proverbs because our tendency is going to be to jump back into post-lockdown life uh, as if nothing's changed, to get back to what it used to be as quickly as possible and not to think through Christianly how we can maybe use this as an opportunity to live distinctly, to do something differently this time, to live rightly, to get into healthier, more life-giving and godly habits than we were before. And living like that, the Bible calls wisdom. And so we're in Proverbs to pick up a lot of wisdom to help guide us through this new stage of life as we walk into post-lockdown freedoms. So two weeks ago, we looked at how the Bible helps us uh, with wisdom, with words, as we spend more time face to face with other people. And today, we're going to look at how the Bible guides us in making wise choices when it comes to money. Because we've all got new money choices ahead of us going into this summer. According to the Bank of England, 28% of you will have had a decrease in household income because of COVID. You'll be in a new situation now. But then that also means 72% of you will either be in the same situation or, or better. 
But also, 57% of you, say the Bank of England, will have spent this last year spending a whole lot less. And so that means right now, some of you might not be financially that great, but all of a sudden you're presented with opportunities for holidays abroad on the green list and uh, uh, restaurants to go to. You can eat out, more and more opportunities to spend, spend, spend. And then there's others of you who are doing okay. And actually, because you haven't spent much over the last year, you've got a little bit extra saved up. So you're ready now to go and hit the high streets slash exercise classes slash festival scene slash whatever it is you've got planned for that extra cash. Well, before you get your credit card out, stop with me for a while in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs has a lot to say about money some really, really great truths that will actually help us spend it well, to help us avoid falling into traps, to stop us from blowing our money. It tells us where we can invest it best, and it points us to where we're going to find real richness, no matter how thick or thin your wallet is. It tells us about spending and slaving, giving and getting, and fear and freedom. Now we're going to start off in chapter 3, in that section that was just read for us just now. So keep that open. But the way Proverbs talks about money is scattered out throughout the whole book, really. So we're going to be dipping in from place to place as we go on. So as we come to Proverbs, let's just pause a moment and pray and ask for God's help. Father God, we pray that as we come seeking your wisdom on money, that you will speak. And we pray that what comes up in this sermon will be your wisdom through your spirit, through the word. And not human philosophies, not good human ideas. We pray that we won't take away what seem like humanly wise tips, but that we would actually be reoriented to look to you for our wisdom. And that as we look at Proverbs today, you'd make us receptive and open and your spirit would work in our hearts to make us people who uh, will Take on board your wisdom and turn to you. Lean not on our own understanding, but seek you as the person who will really give us wisdom to make the most of what we have in the world this summer. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's pick up some wisdom then. The first thing wisdom tells us about money is this. Spend. Don't slave. Spend. Don't slave. Now, I don't know if you're the type of person who goes in for productivity apps. I've got a bit of a love-hate relationship uh, with this one. It's called Todoist, and it's basically just a well-ordered, colour-coordinated to-do list. Now, the thing with to-do lists is that they start off as quite a good idea. Because, of course, they, they mean you don't forget things. You can keep track of all the things you need to do. And when you tick them off, well, hey, you feel quite good about yourself. But if you're anything like me, you'll know that there are just some things on there that just never get done and they just kind of get pushed back up the list. And the list, instead of shrinking, just keeps growing and growing. And in the end, what you've got left is not so much a, a little assistant, a helpful thing to assist you in your jobs. But what you've got is more like a, an overbearing, judgmental boss with a list of things you haven't done. And that's my love-hate relationship with to-do lists. They're good servants, but they're bad masters. And the same is true with money. It's a good servant, but it's a bad master. So to use money with godly wisdom, oh, you've got to see it as a servant. You've got to use it, put it to work, use it for good, and not be enslaved by it. You should spend it and don't slave. Now, the wisdom in Proverbs is that money is actually a really good thing. Have a look at that passage from chapter 3. We're going to start off in verses 9 and 10. Honour the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. I don't think the expectation is that the wealthy person is going to eat what's in his barn and drink that wine. This is produce to sell. In other words, this is productivity and profit. This is money. This is more wealth. And that first line assumes that you have something like wealth, which just as an aside, I think we all do have. 
in world terms, if you look at the entire world now and just the world throughout history, if you're somebody who has a home to live in, you don't need to own the home, but just somewhere that you do live and stay securely. And if you've got running water, you generally have your meals every day and you can afford to get the bus and have a coffee. Well, you've got enough to live on and you've got a bit more. Well, in world terms, you're actually one of the wealthy ones. So it is speaking to you when it talks about wealth. Proverbs is going to address you as the rich. It's going to tell you to do something with your wealth. And I want us to just get that mindset from the off that we are the wealthy. But the thing is, in this proverb, the wealthy is, being, is, is fine being wealthy. It's good having money. And in fact, there in verse 10, it says that one way that you might experience blessing from God is to get more wealth. So wealth is clearly a good thing. God is giving it as a blessing. If it's a blessing, well, it must be good. Have a look at another proverb. It says this, the blessing of the Lord brings wealth without painful toil for it. Now that's not saying that all Christians are going to get rich without working hard for it, but rather just that if you have money that you're healthy enough to spend, well that's a blessing of the Lord. The Lord has blessed you in that way. And Proverbs also sees the flip side as being true. If you're, if you're not living the wise life, well then you will miss out on some of the great blessings that God has got, and so you wouldn't be getting the wealthy. Uh, Proverbs 10 verse 4, lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. So money is good, but money is good when it's God's. Money is good when it's God's. Uh, the key in those verses we started with, in chapter 3, in verse 9, the key is how that starts. Honour the Lord with your wealth. Honouring the Lord with your wealth means treating it as if it belongs to God. Considering your money to be his, not yours. So money is good, and it's good to have, and it's good to spend. But before you click Add to Basket or Book Now... Just ask yourself the question, is this a way that God would have me use this money? Is this why he gave it to me? If, if, if it is still his, then what would he have me do with it? And actually, yeah, buying nice stuff is fine. And booking holidays is fine. And we can enjoy that and turn that into praise to God. And we can honour God with our wealth. But just run it through that filter first. Just to check that what you're doing is doing something that's going to honour God and result in praise and not... You running away with excitement uncontrollably at how happy this is going to make you. Use your money as a servant, in control of it, and make sure that it's doing something that's going to help you to honour God. You do that and it's good. Just like a to-do list. Use it properly, well, it brings great reward. But just like a to-do list, money's a bad master. Might you being be being mastered by money? Here's some questions. Are your choices, so like a choice of a, a job or where you live or what kind of flat you live in or what to wear, are your choices determined and guided by what's going to make you more money? Well, then you're really listening to money to help guide you. Money's mastering you. Do you prioritise your time so that your time becomes money so you can earn more? at the expense of actually spending time enjoying the wealth that God has given you in order to enjoy anyway. Well, money is, is making you serve it. Money is mastering you. On the other hand, are you meticulous about saving, but really stingy about spending? Well, money is mastering you. And Proverbs warns us that money is a bad master for at least three reasons. Number one, it blinds. Have a look at this proverb. The rich are wise in their own eyes. The one who is poor and discerning sees how deluded they are. See, when money masters you, this proverb says, you confuse being rich with being wise. With more money, of course, you can do more things. And so life tends to work out well and so you think you're good at making decisions. You think you're living well and, and God must be pleased. 
Because if money is your master, you probably imagine that you're wiser than you actually are. And Proverbs wants to warn you today, if you've answered yes to those questions, if money is mastering you in any way, well then watch out that you're not confusing being rich with being wise. Because money blinds. Uh, number two, it betrays another proverb. Uh, the last one was 28, 11. This is 11, 28. Those who trust in their riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. Those who trust in their riches will fall. So you can't trust in wealth. We've got this thing called financial security. And have you ever wondered what it actually is? I mean, it promises security. But security from what? Because we know, don't we, it's plenty obvious that financial security isn't security from illness or family breakdown or accidents or addictions or mental illness. And it's not even security against bankruptcy. We see investments dive and banks crash. So what does financial security mean? What security does money offer? Because Proverb warns you that if you serve money and you trust it, if you think it'll have your back, well, it won't. It betrays you. And number three, it buckles. Another proverb, wealth is worthless in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. This is what this is saying is in the grand scheme of things, in life and death matters. When the stakes are high, money buckles. In terms of what you take with you beyond the grave, in the most important questions, well, money becomes just irrelevant. It's worthless at the end of the day. When your time comes to meet your maker, all of the things you've been serving and saving, the money and wealth, it's just going to be nothing. It's buckled. It's irrelevant. It's of no use. And this proverb says that only righteousness, and what that means is having your relationship with God cleared up and sorted out. And it's only that that gives you security in death and through death and out the other side. So then, we've said money is a good servant, but a bad master. So for you, what this means is with the little that you have left after a lean lockdown or with all the savings you've saved up, well, it means you should be on, in control and spend it and spend it with wi wisdom. Spend it wisely and don't let it master you. You can use it and you can spend it and you can enjoy it. And enjoy it as a blessing from God and thank him. And you can use it for what God wants you to use it for. Do what honours him. Honour the Lord with your wealth. When you handle it, handle it carefully because, you know, it bites. It blinds, it betrays, and it buckles. So don't live for it. Don't hoard it. Don't believe anything that it promises. And don't slave for it. You are free to spend it. Well, okay, I can hear you say, I'll honour God with it. And I'll spend it. But spend it on what? What can I spend it on that honours God? What is God's favourite use of my money. If it belongs to God anyway, well, what would he have me do with it? Well, I'm glad you asked, because Proverbs gives us another principle about the wise use of money, and it's this. Giving comes before getting. Giving comes before getting. Now, that's, that's my summary of two things that Proverbs says about money. Uh, that Number one, the wise person is generous with their wealth. So in Proverbs, when it talks about the wise, they, they're generous people. And number two, the wise person who is generous with their wealth always gets something back. So giving, generosity, comes before getting, but getting does come. And there is something to be gotten back. So look at another proverb with me. This time we'll spend a little bit of time in chapter 11 verses 24 and 25. Two verses back to back. Here's what it says. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. 
a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Now, I, I love this. This is brilliant, brilliant godly wisdom. But I'd have a, a guess that you already knew this. If you've ever come across Ebenezer Scrooge. Now, many of you will know who Ebenezer Scrooge is, but I'm conscious that not everybody watching will be from a, a British background. And he's a character in a book, a story that's been made into films, uh, that is a, quite an old uh, English language book. So perhaps you won't have come across it, but uh, Ebenezer Scrooge is a man who runs a business back in the olden days, hundreds of years ago. And he makes lots of money and he loves to keep the money. And as he makes money, he's getting all of what he loves. He's getting his heart's desire. But he loves money more than anything else, and so he treats his employees really badly. Now, the, the story is set around Christmas time, when they are all uh, wanting to be generous and have time off at Christmas, and he doesn't want them to have time off. He is stingy, because every day, every minute, every moment is money. And he can be making more and more of it. And as you read the story or watch the film, of course, we as the viewer start to learn that Ebenezer Scrooge is actually a sad man. He has all the money he could want, but there's something missing. He's cruel, he's not kind, he doesn't have friends. He's missing an awful lot in life. And of course the story goes that he, he's going to be transformed, so he goes to bed on Christmas Eve and he's visited by various ghosts who give him visions um, so that he realises that actually he is a poor man. He is a sad man, and that he has all the money he could possibly want, but he's just not getting richness in life. And so, of course, he wakes up in the morning, and that famous scene where he opens his window and shouts to the closest person, Hey boy, what day is it today? And the boy says, Well, Ebenezer, it's, it's Christmas Day, you idiot, because last night was Christmas Eve, right? So, it's Christmas Day today. And Scrooge gets him to buy a turkey, and he shares for the first time. And Scrooge learns that uh, when you give away, you actually get back a lot more. Now, that's a heartwarming story. So it might sound a bit sentimental. But you know, Proverbs says that's true. It says one person gives freely, yet gains even more. That's what Scrooge needed to learn. And another withholds unduly, just like Scrooge, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper, and whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Now this is a proverb that appears to be about money. It's about using money wisely. But it's actually a proverb that's more about the heart than it is about money. It's showing us that the wisest use of money comes when in our hearts we see what's really most valuable. It's designed to teach us this proverb that what is most valuable is people and not money and stuff. And this shows us a bit of God's heart. What it is that God would have us do with the good wealth he's given us. How we can honour God with that unspent extra. Because it's telling us that wise spending is generous giving. And yet, it assures us that that's sensible and smart use of your money. Because it says we'll get something back. And what we get back will actually be more valuable than what we give up. When we give generously, here's what happens. You start to prize money less and less, and people more. When you give the money away, you're less interested in the money, and you're more interested in the person you're looking to help. And that change from, from being concerned about the money to being concerned about the people because, because you've given it freely and generously to them, well, that starts to get you invested in people. And that starts to show you more and more, you start to share God's heart for, for people. And you start to view money just as the tool to serve people. And because that type of wisdom changes you to love money less and people more, then you start you don't actually want money back from that relationship. You don't want money back from your generosity, but you want the good of people, which is exactly what you get. 
So you then do actually get back something more valuable than what you lose because the good of people becomes more valuable to you than anything you could give away. See, when money is your servant and you make your servant serve others, well, then you're never going to lose out. And instead of blindness and betrayal and buckling, there is a real return from generosity. If you prioritise giving, well, you'll get even better dividends. So, before Boris puts more countries on that green list, and before the sun comes out and the world is making up for a year's worth of parties, and before you, you go and hit those Primark sales, well, stop and put giving generously first, so that you can reap back what is most valuable. So, pause and think, do you know a situation where you can help financially? Uh, perhaps it's not actually giving money to someone, maybe it's loaning them some money, or, or maybe it's just meeting a financial need they have, covering a cost, a rent or a car insurance. Or is there a charity you've been meaning to give to? You know it's good, but you've never gotten around to it. Or perhaps now, at the beginning of a new possibilities at the end of this lockdown, perhaps now would be a very good time for you to say, well, before I <laughs> offload all of that money, to do what I want to do, well, let's actually invest it well in, in people. So maybe now is the best time to review your giving to charity or to church or to mission and work out what it would look like on your standing orders if you were generous. Or it might not even be giving what you've got. It might be just focusing less on getting. So could you volunteer with refugees instead of getting a part-time job? Now, it's going to be different for all of you. I, I don't know. You have to make up that decision yourself. But whatever you can find that helps you overflow with generosity is going to be something that leads you away from money's mastery and back to the wealth of wisdom. It's a smart way to think about money. It's a smart way to spend. And it's wise. Now listen, I want you to do this, but the hard thing is that you can't just grow that wisdom just by upping your standing order by £10. Doing that generous giving, it honours God, it's good, and it begins to change what you value most, but if you want to really go in wholeheartedly with wisdom with money, it's going to need an even deeper change on the inside rather than just a number on a payment slip. And here's how that happens. We can't remove money as a master. We have to replace it. There's a, an iconic scene in a, uh, one of the old Indiana Jones movies. Um, Indiana Jones, in case you haven't watched it or if you're not of a certain age perhaps, uh, Indiana Jones is a, an explorer, an adventurer, and he's in a cave, like an underground cavern or a tomb. I can't actually remember what the type of room it is, but he's in a room and he's at the end of his adventure and he's, he's come and he's found the treasure that he was after. And it's this beautiful golden idol that's kind of shining and glowing on, on this plinth. But all the way along, the route has been booby-trapped. So it's a kind of underground cave where you lean on, on the wrong rock and it pushes in and the walls start pushing in or um, you walk past a tripwire and arrows come out the wall and as he sees this idol on the plinth that he wants to take he can see the skeletons around and Indiana Jones knows that um, it's booby trapped you know you can't just take that idol off and, and make a run for it and he realizes that um, the idol is on like a pressure pad so if he's going to take it away he he needs to replace it with something that weighs the same well, that's what's key for us. If we're going to take the right view of money and use it wisely in our post-lockdown freedoms, if money's going to stop mastering us, something else has got to take its place. And Proverbs helps us with that too. Because we find in Proverbs, fear frees you. Fear frees you. For this, we're going to go back to Proverbs 3, the passage we started with. We've already looked at it, but this time, 
Let's get the fuller picture. I'm going to go back and read from verse 5 of chapter 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honour the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Now, if you followed uh, the, the last sermon that we did in our series on Acts, that was a few weeks ago, and also the first sermon we did in Proverbs two weeks ago, you might have noticed this phrase crop up that keeps coming back and that we keep landing on. And here it is again. The fear of the Lord. That's what's at the heart of the wisdom Proverbs teaches about money. It all stems from the fear of the Lord. It's the fear of the Lord that uncovers our blindness to show you the truth that money is a bad master. It's fear of the Lord that enables you to escape the slavery to the lie of financial security and place a better master at the centre. Fear of the Lord enables you to do the Indiana Jones switch. Fear of the Lord tells you what to put in its place. And it doesn't mean fear as in being scared. Fear of the Lord in the Bible is it's a deep reverence. But it's also a deep sense of joy and privilege and humility and gratitude just to, to know and be known by a being so awesome and mighty and eternal. And fear is the surrender before the Almighty, and yet it's having security in that surrender. And it's expressed in the life of the wise person, in their daily walk, as they trust in the Lord with all their heart and lean not on their own understanding. It's acknowledging him in all their ways, pursuing him, distrusting their own wisdom and preferring to listen to God's word. That's how fear of the Lord is expressed. That's what you do naturally if you're joyfully and safely surrendering to, to the, the greatest, the most awesome. Now, when Proverbs was first written, people came to this fear of the Lord by the drama of the Old Testament fiery sacrifices the discipline of daily rituals, the ceremony and the priests. But God brings us, you and I, to fear him through showing us what he's like in Jesus. If you look into Jesus, Jesus was God on earth and people close to him feared him. They saw his majesty when he had power over nature and, and over sickness and over death. He was awesome to be feared, and yet everyone who knew him and was known by him had this humble joy and privilege. In knowing Jesus, the almighty man, well, there was such a security in surrender. And that's how we can learn to fear the Lord. The more we know Jesus, the more we revere Jesus and trust in Jesus, the more we surrender to him, well, the more we fear the Lord. And yet, we've got all the security we need to be able to surrender because we know that Jesus died for us and he rose from the dead. And so he is the awesome, the literally awe-inspiring God Almighty, but we are secure in our surrender to him. He's eternal, but he came. He is mighty, but he loves. There's nothing to be lost in surrendering all to him and looking to him as our wisdom. And that's really what's at the heart of, of this wisdom in Proverbs for you and I. Awe in Jesus, 
Hope in Jesus, trust in Jesus. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways submit to him. Oh, we're actually meant to be talking about money here, aren't we? But that's the thing. It's this fear of the Lord, this standing in awe of God in Jesus, that enables us to do the Indiana Jones switch. It's that that enables us to take something better, something we can truly trust, something that we can put our hope in, something that never blinds or betrays or buckles, something that we can trust as a master and to put that in the centre, to put Jesus in the centre. And it's then, as only then, that we can actually start to live out this freeing and life-giving attitude towards money. Because fear frees you. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Fear is what frees you to honour the Lord with your wealth. Without fear of loss, you're not losing anything. In fact, your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Well, summer is around the corner, apparently. The restrictions are nearly all lifted and so we've got choices to make. Proverbs won't tell you, as you've seen, Proverbs isn't going to tell you how much to spend on barbecues and dresses and holidays. But it does give us a realistic perspective on the good and the bad of money. And it ultimately points us to the fact that if we want to spend it well, if we want to enjoy it with thanks, if we want to use it in life-giving and refreshing ways, then we need to use it in its right place. We need to take it off the plinth and replacing it with Jesus. Then you can use money to serve us, to serve others, as we serve Jesus. So just first of all, invest all you can in getting to know Jesus more and more, admire him, adore him, be amazed by him. And in that, know more and more that security of surrender to him. That's the fear of the Lord. Do that and money will, you'll see what it really is. It'll stop being the master that blinds, betrays and buckles and it'll become your servant to enjoy, to serve, to enjoy generously. Love Jesus, fear the Lord. Rule your money, make it work. Be generous, click, add to basket, give glory. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the blessing of money and that we are talking here about something you give us. And Lord, we've seen that when it's in the wrong place, it is destructive. But when it's in the good place, you, you allow us to bless others with it. And so, Lord, we do really want your wisdom to show us how to get it in its right place. We pray, Lord, that you would give us a true reverence and awe for you as our Father and Jesus as our Lord. The Holy Spirit would be in us, bringing about that change and that worship. And we pray that particularly today, that you would cultivate the fear of the Lord in us that we then might understand how rightly to use that money, that we won't be blinded, we won't be taken in by it. Lord, give us the fear of the Lord so that we can be generous. Give us the fear of the Lord so that we won't fear what we lose when we're generous, but we would actually enjoy what we gain. And Lord, we pray that in all of this, it would overflow with thanks to you, the giver of all good things. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray now together. When I say, Lord, in your mercy, you can respond with, hear our prayer. Let's pray together. Lord, we want to thank you for all that you have provided for us. And we pray for wisdom in how we use what you have given to us. Thank you for what we have learned today and help us be mindful of this as we consider our use of money. Lord, we confess we don't always use money wisely. Forgive us and help us to reshape our thinking in accordance with your word and to learn wisdom in using money. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
Lord, help us to use and enjoy what you have given us, but to not be mastered by money. We don't want to be slaves to it. Instead, give us wisdom and help us to use money wisely to benefit others who are in need and for your glory. Help us be both individuals and a church who are distinctively generous. Lord, your word says, honour God with your wealth. I pray that you will help us to be those more hospitable, more generous, and that we will be those keen to help those around about us in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And for brothers and sisters abroad, much poorer than we, help us generously help them as they seek to feed people both physically, mentally, emotionally and spiritually. We pray we can be generous givers to our mission partners, some who are labouring in poverty-stricken regions. We pray, Lord, for our friends and partners in Lebanon. Help us to help them share of your goodness as they seek to love others and tell them of the hope they can find in Jesus, sent to save, sent from you, our unfathomably generous Father. And Lord, as our gift day approaches, help us to be thinking about our giving, Lord, and to enjoy giving and to enjoy being part of your purpose and your purposes this way in our world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to all now say the Lord's Prayer together, which shall come up in your screen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're going to have a time now where we can all pray in our own individual households. So obviously you can pray as a household together or on your own. Or why not call a friend uh, from church and speak with them and pray with them uh, together. Please do feel free to post some prayer points on the chat. It would be great to have these and we can all pray for you there. But please be mindful that it is a public forum um, and so be discreet as you write those prayers in. The staff will be praying again for these in the week. In the meantime, enjoy praying together.
draw your prayers to a close. Gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to gain. He is my joy, my righteousness, my freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus.
Let's pray. Lord, thank you again for the reminder today of your holiness, your difference, and your difference to us in the vastness of your love that sent Jesus to die in our place, and that through trusting in him, we can know his salvation. We see such immense generosity in your love and kindness to us. So help us to be wisely generous too, in lots of ways, and especially in the business of money that we've been thinking about today. We thank you that ultimately all you have given us is yours. Help us to give this wisely and generously to others in need, whether friends here or brothers and sisters in Christ abroad. Help us to demonstrate our gratitude to your generosity to us in a generous response to others and for your glory. We pray, thanking you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us today at Christchurch Liverpool. We've got lots of things going on at Christchurch and we'd love you to get involved with us. Do you know, we've all realised the value of connecting with people in person through this COVID time, haven't we? And as a church, we really want to reconnect with you if we haven't seen you for a while and to connect with you for the first time if you're new with us. And one way of connecting is through shared interests. And it also gives us a chance then to invite friends who might not normally come along to church, but they might share an interest with us. And this is a great way that they can get to know other Christian people. So we've got a new web page, Join Me Doing, where you can contact people in church who are involved in different activities or interest groups. So please check out christchurchliverpool.org forward slash join me doing. And if you see anything there, please do get in touch if you like it and you're interested in finding out more. And please share this with friends because we do want to embrace people who are beyond our church and get to know them. And that way, others can come along and get more involved too. All of our notices and the rest of them are available on our website, christchurchliverpool.org forward slash notices. Please click there to find out what's going on. We'd really love to get to know you if you're new and welcome you. So if you go to the I'm new button on the homepage, then we can get back in touch with you and share things going on in Christchurch and meet up with you and get to know you a little bit better. Finally, please do click the subscribe button to get any new notifications or postings from us. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll be on live stream, Lord willing, again next week, but please do try and come along to meet us in person if you can and just sign up there on our website. Thanks so much. God bless you.